As with most indigenous folks, um, I begin by introducing who I am and where I come from uh, a little bit more than uh, the introduction that I've had. And so I want you to meet my family. My wife, Bev, of uh, 45 years this October, and, and our three children, uh, twin daughters. Uh, I, I was introduced to a new branch of science when they were born. They're mirror twins. Uh, I didn't know such things existed. Um, uh, they, um, they took every effort at this stage in their life to look different, uh, but uh, they are mirror twins. One's right-handed, one's left. One's dominant right brain, one's dominant left. One hair part is right and one hair part is left, but otherwise uh, they are the same, uh, sort of. Our son Matt. Um, all are involved in the indigenous community, work somewhere in the world. Our son in Matt in the Philippines. Uh, I come from a place we call Mi'kma'ki, um, the land of the dawn or of the people of the dawn, place where the sun comes to life. I'm from a region uh, of the seven districts of our community known as Gaspagic, the place where the rocks meet the water, and our ancestral home is Listigush, First Nation. And I emphasize the L so that you wouldn't say Restigouche, as the French like to say, since we don't have an R in our language. Um, uh, I wanted to talk this morning about uh, two uh, conflicting experiences that we have had in the indigenous world. One with religion, <coughs> pardon me, one with religion and the other with science. And, um, and, and so, uh, I hope that it'll make some sense. But before I do that, I do want to say that uh, science does tend to create these uh, perceptions of us um, uh, that, I, that I'd like to sort of dispossess you of. I am a, a native person, and if you say what part of me is native because I'm pigmentally challenged, I'm going to be really irritated. Uh, about as irritated as you might be if this were the picture. My wife raises black labs, has also raised yellow labs, uh, is working on a chocolate lab this spring, and uh, is looking forward to her most significant challenge <laughs> in the days ahead. Uh, she's a horse trainer as well. This is my land, uh, Mi'kma'ki. Mi where my ancestors have dwelt for, uh, well, more time than we can remember. Um, our contact with Europeans extends back uh, some of the earliest of days. My own family history is traced in the intermarriages of our family uh, through the Catholic Church records quite extensively, and the first intermarriage took place, uh, depending on whether you listen to my youngest uncle or my eldest uncle, uh, 1586 or 1606 on the deck of a, a ship off the coast of what is now known as Grand Pre. So this is the land that, we, that I grew up in um, for a significant part of my life and that shapes my thinking about, about the nature of land. It is uh, described by our uh, creation myth uh, as a land that the creator, Gichiniskam, Magatniskam, Kesu, created with the assistance of uh, of uh, Kluskap, the co-creative being. And it's that myth or those stories that root me in not only uh, who I am as an indigenous person, but also, of course, the worldview from which I come. And so I'd like to address some of that today. For the past several years, a good friend of mine, Phil Duran, a Tiwa Pueblo Indian, has participated in a program called the Seed Dialogues as a part of an inner circle of about 20 individuals, uh, most of them quantum physicists. It was through Phil's participation there that I was introduced to the useful notion of suspending our tacit infrastructure, the implicit worldview or paradigms that operate within each of us as people, in order to allow ideas to flow more freely during our communication. The tacit infrastructure is the foundational philosophy from which an individual approaches knowledge, interprets experience, and asserts what is real. It finds expression in statements that are made openly and believed to be true. Although the individual making those assertions may not be aware of the deeply rooted assumptions upon which they are based, they are nonetheless held with tenacity. 
A culture's particular epistemology or theory of knowledge encompasses the doctrines and assumptions of that culture and therefore addresses such questions as what it means to know and what knowledge is validated. Western science, therefore, stems from Western epistemology, a major assumption of which is that knowledge exists only if it can be measured. That's what I learned in my undergraduate degree. Native peoples, on the other hand, embrace the whole human experience in their traditional practices, rather than limiting themselves to what can be gathered and interpreted through the physical senses. An essential element of native spirituality is the reciprocal relationship between humans and the natural world. Thank you for mentioning that this morning. We think differently about the world in which we find ourselves. An essential element of native spirituality is the reciprocal relationship between humans and the natural world, which includes plant and animal and the entire cosmos. It cannot be overstated that native spirituality is not simply a belief system. It is a way of life that incorporates this relationship as an essential and integral part of indigenous traditional practices, which represent for us empirical science as well. Many scientists from this tradition, including noted, <coughs> excuse me, from the Western tradition, including noted physicist Dative Bohm, have recognized the constraints imposed by the scientific method and are calling for a new paradigm that in intersects with indigenous ways of knowing. And of course, uh, those of you here in this room are probably as familiar with these things as I am. Because science is a human activity as well as a body of knowledge and is deeply influenced by a culture's epistemology, it's important to understand the frames created by that worldview. One of Western science's dominant characteristics is to bifurcate life into sacred and secular realms. I remember being in the steps of the state legislature in Madison, Wisconsin, many years ago. Um, and there I could preach my spiritual truths and understandings in a way that a Western person or an American citizen could not because of the separation of church and state. And the reason for that is that we do not make that sacred secular separation the same way that Western society has or the sacred and profane, or the religious and the non-religious, the empirical and the non-empirical. By the 15th century, when Western culture was imported to North America by European immigrants and later developed into North American culture, it had already deviated from the Greek worldview that originally kept these things in attention and had simply borrowed the the bifurcations uh, of dualism that uh, we recognize so much in Western science. The existence of different epistemologies and knowledge bases are evidence of the Earth's human diversity, however. One point of divergence between Western and indigenous thought is how science is defined. Western thought tends to limit science to the creative endeavor of the human mind, selecting from human experience only the information that can be counted and measured. Unfortunately, this science is often falsely portrayed as the whole of reality. Indigenous knowledge systems, on the other hand, encompass the whole of experience, not simply cognitive, not simply the mind. We include spirit, language, culture, practice, community, and customs. The worldviews of tribal societies include the cosmos or universe. Thus, in the physical realm, they have at least the same scope as Western science, but we think of it differently. It's integrated, interrelated, interdependent, interconnected. So as we listen to most of what science offers out of the West today, we're still talking about incursions of humans into the rest of the environment as if it is out there and we stand separate and away from it. And we continue to see it simply as resource now to be managed in a slightly more um, generous way, in a way that is slightly more observant of the fact that it is no longer giving us what we need in the ways that we need it, or at least it's degenerating in such a way that what we want from it will no longer be available to us if we're not more careful. But it's still very anthropocentric. It still requires humanity to be at the pinnacle as opposed to perceived as an integral part of the whole. And this is what science in the Western conception of it has continued to propagate, which I think um, 
has been so destructive. The cultural biases of science textbooks themselves often simply echo people like Hans Eysenck's dictum, if it cannot be measured, it does not exist. I would argue that that's not true. And certainly in his day, there were things that were subsequently observed that he would say were unable to be measured that were then measured that came into existence as new knowledge. We make assumptions about what is animate and what is inanimate or denigrate tribal cultures as primitive and use references and innuendos that are outside of science when we speak about indigenous cultures. So I'm a primitive. Um, I like to joke on occasion with my friends that I'm just a poor, ignorant savage. Um, and of course, poke fun at myself about that, but that's really in my history. All of the intermarriages in my family that took place over the centuries were the European name of the individual marrying into our people and the uh, generally woman who received simply the name un femme sauvage. So we, we kind of think of ourselves in those ways still because that's the way Western science has portrayed us. Dominant notions about human nature and the goals of science stem from assumptions and doctrines that are s deeply seated in North American cultures. Humans are seen as progressively overcoming barriers along a path that will achieve the ultimate human potential. It's intriguing that the Jesuits who missioned my people back in the early 1600s, my ancestor, Gich Sagamo Membertu, was baptized by a Jesuit, uh, Jesse Flaché, June 24, 1610. Uh, and from that point to this, they continued to see us as somehow less than human, describing the land that they uh, found us in as a, quote, land that Satan himself had forsaken. It's this intriguing idea that we think somehow, because we're in the 21st century, we've, uh, we've abandoned, that still uh, finds itself situate under much of Western science when it comes into contact with indigenous people and ways of knowing. In the same way that religious systems, particularly Christianity, and I am a, uh, a Mi'kmaq person who is a follower of the Jesus way in my life, in the traditions of my people, very much the same as Gichisagamo member to back in 1610. But the perception of the religious uh, uh, missionaries of the day was that we were godless heathen savages, that we had no knowledge of value. And so to hear that we actually have some knowledge of value today, that actually we might offer a perspective that has been steamrollered for decades and perhaps centuries uh, is, is a, a grateful thing. While North Americans express these views with confidence, they are not always valid in indigenous worldviews. Things like conquest, linear progression, human hegemony over nature, these in our mind do not represent sustainable science. What's more, such ways of thinking have tended to treat the earth as commodity. And again, this morning, uh, as I was walking over here listening to conversations going on ahead of me, I'm hearing conversations that see the earth as commodity. And it reminded me of, of just the experience I have when I go into surgery and the doctor incises my skin. The moment the doctor does that, uh, my body responds not just at the site of the incision, but as a totality. There is an overarching response within my body to try and address the incision and what's taking place in this incursion. Western science somehow thinks that these isolated incursions that we have on the face of the earth do not elicit the same sorts of uh, global response, the same interconnected, interdependent kinds of responses. Or if we do, we try to isolate them and then uh, adopt a new policy uh, or a new scientific practice so as to uh, mitigate the consequence. Indigenous folks realize that this earth, some of us call Mother Earth, is deeply, deeply, deeply a whole, not a part. The UN recognizes the wealth of traditional knowledge possessed by indigenous peoples, and uh, recently understood that this knowledge amassed over centuries and millennia of living close to nature in their respective environments had important contributions to make to our sustainability as a species. Uh, in the earth. 
In parts of Canada, this is referred to as Aboriginal knowledge, and it's been accumulated experientially over time without the use of modern instrumentation. And it is local to the particular place inhabited by a people. My very good friend Kenny Blacksmith, a Cree from northern Quebec, when he and Grand Chief Matthew Kuncombe were dealing with the hydro development projects in Quebec and found their way down to the United Nations to make presentation, went to see his mother, uh, troubled over how he was going to present to the United Nations a Cree perspective on the land. And his mother, in her infinite wisdom as a Cree woman, simply said, Kenny, go out on the land and listen to the trees and they'll tell you what to say. Now, that doesn't sound very scientific. Uh, to most of us in this room, it would be superstition at best, I suppose, or a misunderstanding of the environment. But for Kenny and his people, deeply spiritually connected to the land of their people for as many centuries as they've been there, this was good wisdom. This was scientific wisdom. Because the trees had spoken to them in the past, they would again. Indigenous knowledge requires direct observation of how each ecosystem functions. It requires the proper management practices and techniques required to sustain them. And it requires a deep understanding of appropriate relationships to the plants and animals. It has to be reliable for the people depend on it for their survival. You have to be able to understand the environment if you are to survive. And our, our cultures were very much survival cultures. Uh, we quite frankly, mistake the fact that Western culture is also a survival culture. That you're seeking to eke out an existence on this earth and survive on it. And unfortunately, Western methodologies, Western applications of science have tended in treating it as commodity um, to diminish the very thing that provides for your survival. Because ecologies vary from place to place, different knowledge systems exist throughout the world, but they are unfortunately vulnerable to external influences such as intrusions by other humans or governments seeking to extract resource without reference to the implications for the entirety of the environment. The Cross-Cultural Science and Technology Units Project at the University of Saskatchewan and the Alaska Rural Systemic Initiative at the University of Alaska are two examples where systemic integration of indigenous and Western scientific knowledge is occurring. And I think are good examples of how we can begin to migrate towards a blended understanding of the world in which we live and the science that we employ to both understand it uh, and in some respects manage our lives within it. Unlike the manner in which Western scientists have tended to acquire and catalog knowledge into compartments through specialization, indigenous peoples generally view the world as a unified whole, employing such concepts as everything has spirit. All things are related. We are in constant motion and flux. Space, place, frame of reference are important rather, in tempora rather than temporality. All matter is vibrating energy. There's a preeminence of natural law. The focus is always on renewal. And we focus on wholeness and cyclical patterns. These are a part of the way that we do science. Knowledge in an indigenous worldview transcends the physical and involves the whole of human experience. This more realistic view recognizes that humans are spiritual as well as physical beings and sees the world as an intimate relationship of living things in which everything is connected. It's an experiential principle not arrived at through dogma. Because of it, wider paths to discovery have been possible than by assuming the limited notion of a material world consisting of inanimate objects. A conscious awareness of the unseen world of spirit and respect for the powers in the universe characterizes the spirituality of indigenous societies. It's not an abstract notion, political ideal, or set of doctrines that, for many in non-indigenous societies, often bring the comfort of belief at the expense of the continuous pursuit of knowledge. All living things are seen as relatives. The people view their role in a kind of covenant and reciprocal relationship role with the land, not simply as stewards and guardians, but as an integral part of the ecosystem. The people know in a very clear way that they do belong to the land. 
In a mechanistic or reductionist world, uh, view of the world, everything in the universe, even biological systems, can be reduced to physical entities as the ultimate constituents of reality. The view assumes that a system can be taken apart and put back together by considering only the individual properties of each part. But for this to be true, each part would have to behave the same, whether in isolation or as part of the system. However, science is beginning to discover that the world is not simply a machine. As physicist, physicist Fred Wolf asserts in taking Quantum Leap, leap rather, they are increasingly recognizing the existence of emergent properties in natural systems. That is, parts of a system are able to function together and self-organize in ways that they would not function by themselves. As a result, some of the specialized disciplines in science, such as biology, ecology, and others, are being merged into larger domains that consist of combined disciplines. One compelling example is the shift from geology to earth system science, which views the whole earth as a single system. And these are encouraging changes. The discovery of the quantum over a century ago changed physicists' concept, con concepts about reality. The quantum world is so incredibly small that it's impossible for an observation not to disturb the system. The observer and the observed belong to the same system. Thus, quantum observations lose their objectivity a cherished value among Western science. In quantum mechanics, the future state of a system cannot be predicted except within a range of probabilities, and the flow of time is absent. Unlike the ordinary world in which Newton's laws work, in the quantum world there is no determinism, continuity, or causality. According to internationally acclaimed physicist Paul Davies, many physicists have argued that the act of observation which involves consciousness prompts nature to make up its mind. That's an interesting thought. Following Niels Bohr, who proposed an early quantum model of the atom in 1915 and made numerous other contributions to the understanding of atomic structure and quantum mechanics, there are physicists today who take the view that subatomic particles only come into existence in the presence of an observer. That is, when the system is measured in a kind of observer-created reality. Quantum theory thus involves a certain amount of mysticism as a part of the experience, which makes it relevant to spirituality. It's intriguing that Western science is taking a circular route, finally, to get to the place where we invited them to be, to understand that there is a spiritual reality in all of the creation. And whether you're a creationist, theist, whether you're a creationist, atheist, whether you're a creationist, evolutionist, coming to the place where we recognize the interconnected, interrelated, interdependent nature, coming full circle to say we are not simply an isolated, observing part of that whole, but are indeed an integral, related part of the whole. An alternative explanation, perhaps? As Chief Stan Beardy said, of indigenous thought, there's a creator to whom we are accountable as spiritual beings. We are part of the land that was created and have a spiritual duty to it. If I were to urge anything, it would be to say, irrespective of your religious disposition, uh, irrespective of your religious training or lack thereof, uh, science is beginning to inform us that there is a spirituality about the earth, that indigenous peoples have been um, making clear to y'all for an awfully long time. And the closer you appropriate the understanding that we live in a spiritual reality, not simply a physical one, um, the easier it will be for you to relate to us in the days ahead as indigenous peoples take a greater and greater place at the table of conversations related to the environment that we find ourselves in, as they take a, a larger place in the conversations related not simply to resource extraction, uh, but to public policies that influence and impact on how we organize ourselves as part of the human community. So let me urge you, the first peoples of the Western Hemisphere have experienced profound changes since the arrival of Europeans. Vastly different ideologies clashed with traditional indigenous ways based on sacred relationships between the land and people. 
And while technologies introduced by settlers were designed to benefit the new inhabitants, our tribes have witnessed severe degradation to our ecological and social systems. Yet, we are still here and offer unique, different perspectives of many things, including science. The knowledge we've acquired and, the pr and practice over centuries and millennia of living close to nature in our respective environments is sustainable and has both moral and scientific value. Much of the Earth's history is recorded in our stories. We've witnessed the changes that have occurred over countless generations from the perspective of living in one place for a very long time. It's interesting that the Inuit in the north could tell you that wind patterns have changed dramatically and therefore uh, climate is changing. Uh, the wind patterns they depended on for navigation, that at different times of the year drifted snows in different kinds of ways, uh, now make it difficult for them to navigate. Uh, they would tell you that, that there is a significant shift uh, in the ecosystem in which they find themselves, and it's not simply related to the polar bear. Uh, if we were to listen to them more carefully, and I know some are, we would find that there's a great deal of wisdom in the science of the Inuit, even though it is not empirically practiced as you and I might be familiar with it. <laughs> 